And Debbie Ford has a really fantastic book called The Dark Side of the Light Chasers. And in it, I remember reading it when I was on my way from England to Florida one time on the plane and I opened the book and I just, one of those books where it's just like my mind popped because what she uses is the analogy of a kingdom. And if you imagine yourself as a little child and you're running through the corridors of the most magnificent, lit up, polished kingdom. Everything is beautiful. Everything that you could possibly want is in this magnificent space and all is well until suddenly you hear a knock on the door. And in your excitement, which the body literally interprets the same way as it does fear, you run to the door to find out who it is and suddenly it's the person that you love and that you know loves you the most or should hope that they would because it's a parent or a grandparent or a sibling or someone that you expect to love you as much as you love them. And so you welcomed those people into this inner kingdom of your own making, which is your metaphor for the personality and essentially as you walk them through this kingdom that you are showing off so proudly they say oh that's beautiful and that's great oh i love that but are you sure you should show anyone that room and they make such a big fuss about one aspect of yourself or even if they don't and they just simply say that is enough for us to take it personally because so often at that age before the age of seven we don't even have a conscious mind to discern the information that we're receiving so before the age of seven everything's going directly into the filing cabinet of our mind as if it's an inner search engine that for the rest of our lives that story gets lodged in there it just might if not as frequent be lower on the search results. So you might have other stories that come up sooner, but those stories are still way down there. Just like when you post something that you wish you hadn't, it's always online once you've posted it. The same is true for our inner world too. And if we understand that every single time we took in someone that we loved or that we wanted to love us, going back to what Tim had said about how we're always trying to either prove we're enough or to prove we are not not enough and essentially every time somebody came into our inner world our personality and judged a part of it we shut a part of ourselves down when we did that and essentially what we did was fragmented ourselves off because the part of us that is present was no longer present because now we were stuck in that moment of judgment that we then get to relive and relive and relive, except for it's the aspect of us that we judged that gets to relive that moment. And we get to then reconnect with that aspect of us when someone else asks us to summon the power that is with the one that we shut down. And so if we use that analogy of the inner kingdom to mean every single part of our personality is like a room in this kingdom, instead of just imagining leaving ourselves in this soul fragment going off into the not now moments of any moment but now, instead of imagining something that we can't necessarily quantify, think instead of the inner kingdom. And think about every single room within your kingdom being a personality characteristic or quality that as we invite people in and they make their judgments, we close off each of those rooms when they make the judgment. Or, you know, sometimes when people come in and they just bring all of their baggage, you know that your beautiful kingdom is going to be subject to some kind of trash you know that they're going to drop something by accident or something's going to spill or there's going to be damage when somebody comes with a lot of baggage. We all know that. And yet there are a lot of us little empaths, 
the ones that didn't even know we were empaths and that just take other people's feelings personally. And then because they came in with that much baggage and they are the mirror that we were looking through, then we automatically took on that baggage without realizing it wasn't ours. Or better yet, when somebody comes with all that baggage and then they tell us it was ours in the first place and expect us to store it somewhere. And it's so ugly, we don't even want to, we don't even want to put our energy there. And so we just shove it into a room to come back to here. And then we don't get back to it because life is so full. So we have to really understand, as Debbie Ford shared in her far shorter story than this one, is the fact that as we invited more people into this magnificent kingdom and closed off more and more and more of these rooms, eventually we got to the place of feeling like a broken down bungalow that needs a lot of TLC. We forget that we're the whole kingdom. We forget that we have closed off whole wings and corridors of our own personality. And so the reintegration process can only take place after that Phoenix process in the sacred sojourn of the soul that I often reference and have used or created based on the hero's journey from a soulful perspective is after the dark night of the soul, when we actually experience the dark and light aspects of ourselves understanding we are all things we are all of it and when we actually go from that dark light of the soul which is what i changed it to after having went through the dark night with a k of the ego which is where the victim drama triangle comes in as the four survival archetypes that we're really talking about tonight as we move out of the dark night of the ego, then we go into the dark light of the soul, realizing that we are both an angel and a devil, both on our shoulders and within ourselves. And then we go into the Phoenix process of death and rebirth, which means just like Khaleesi in Game of Thrones, when her husband, Khal Drogo, goes onto the pyre to be burned, she ties the hag from town who was the naysayer, and I forget the specifics, I just know another person got sacrificed to she had, who had been disrespectful and disloyal. And then on top of that, Pyre Khaleesi goes too in order to get burned up to emerge the mother of dragons, which was only possible when the heat and the pressure from the process helped her realize that she was stronger than she once thought. And from that process of emerging from the flames of our own death and rebirth, then we go into an integration phase which is what Tim speaks of. And that very much is where we actually take in all of these lessons and understand that we have to mark a cross at each section of our lives where we let one of those rooms get closed. And then we will together today, and then you can do as many times as you need, go back into that kingdom and open another door and just continually go back to retrieve the aspects of yourself you judged in the past because someone else that you trusted more than yourself said it wasn't good enough. And now you understand that was their story and it no longer needs to define you. And when you get, we, get we, we also, when that does come up, there's a lot of these components that we've, people bring their baggage. Yeah. But they don't remember, they don't even consider the fact that we've already cleaned that part out. And that's how we recognize it instantly when somebody brings up that trash and those beliefs. And it's like, we we know that because we've already cleaned this room out. We also must quickly do a check-in. Because that little part of us might go, oh my God, he's right. I am not good enough. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, honey, that's okay. I'm not going anywhere. I understand and it's okay. So we, that's an, another way that we maintain our integration with that part of us that we had cut off. And we left part of us in one of those rooms. <laughs> he ran in when I wasn't looking and I was like, and I shut the door. And I was like, I'm not going in there no more. And he, and he was locked away for a long time. And it, it does, it takes 
three things for a person to actually address that choice, chance, or crisis. And the vast majority of people demand crisis in order for that, uh, the shell to actually crack open. And it is the light that is actually cracking open to show what we really are deep inside. Absolutely, because we're either moving away from pain or towards pleasure. But most people are more motivated to escape pain and potential doom and death than they are to actually go for what they want. Because the other thing we have to understand that isn't really being talked about a whole lot, but should be given the times that we're in right now, is the fact that it has not been safe to be empowered forever. It really never has. And so we, as beings who are energetic in source and physical in form, are only physical like this once, but our soul stays the same throughout all incarnations, and it has brought baggage with it too. So there are aspects of our personality that our soul may be afraid, particularly afraid of activating, including and especially the higher level emotions that weren't safe before. Because as you shine brighter, you cast a bigger shadow. And people don't like to stand in someone's shadow. It's like when I lived in England, how there was a famous saying about don't stick your head above the parapet. And at first when I was over there, new to the accent, I thought I was hearing power pit, which made sense to me. Because it's like, okay, well, if everybody is in this pit and they're all vying for power, then you don't want to raise your head or else you're going to get lopped off. But essentially, a parapet is the high and low point on the side of an edge or the side of a drawbridge, castle, or kingdom. And so that is actually the place where you hide behind when you're trying to get yourself safely to another destination and you know there might be archers around who are going to take you out with bow and arrow, then you want to be a little cautious about how you're moving. But what some people other than snipers and people that are well versed in recognizing you have to slow down a lot in order to go slowly to the next and therefore it's easier for the sniper or the archer to line up and take you out if you are raising your head above the parapet or you're trying to hide behind the parapets and then you know run cautiously you can't you just have to go fully for it but the thing is is that there are a lot of us that are here that have went fully for it in past lives and we got beheaded and we got hung or burned at the stake or we got drowned and tested whether we were a witch or not and if we sank after 10 minutes and died then we were innocent and if we floated then we got stuck onto a stake and burned because clearly you're supernatural and so can't be trusted you were deemed doomed either way but what is a witch or a wizard there are a great many things and this is not about what they are in this world other than largely they have been the ones that society hasn't understood and the child is terrified of not being understood because ultimately not being understood meant potential banishment and potential banishment meant fending for yourself in a universe that is not kind to the ones who are cold or the ones who are scared. And when we're scared, we're no longer in our sacred selves. We're in the very physical human realm of the survival archetypes that we all really need to be aware of in, or be aware of to be aware of. Because what we have to understand is that these archetypes, the child is one of them that we all share in common, which is why we can all relate to it. Not only have we always all went through the process of being a child to now get to where we are but we also actually have that archetype within us and an archetype is a familiar pattern that gets filled in with energy according to the cookie cutter that it is representing and the four survival archetypes are the child the prostitute the saboteur and the victim. Well, each of these four survival archetypes show up together, and they're either standing in their light side or their shadow side. 
And if we're not aware of how to consciously bring the inner children within us into a creative space or a sacred space, that's when the child then becomes the responsible parent to itself who is willing to go into those rooms and sit next to the child and talk to them and let them know that they're heard and that you understand and that you are willing to listen and that you care enough to sit with them for them to get comfortable with you who hurt them when you left them there all that time ago. But now you are a grown-up version, a master of your own self, because self-mastery is self-actualization, which is the pinnacle of all human needs, according to Abraham Maslow in The Hierarchy of Needs which is what we're motivated by, survival being at the very base, safety next, belonging after that, self-respect after that, and self-actualization as the pinnacle. Well, if we understand that the master and the parent and the warrior are all similar and related because they are the pinnacle ones who have a further view, not because they need to be on top, but because they have positioned themselves in a space where they can keep those who need to be cared for safe. Because we also have a functional and a dysfunctional creative spectrum to everything. And the victim triangle that many people are familiar with that ties to the child because of the four archetypes is the victim, punisher, or persecutor, and the rescuer, or the martyr archetypes. Understanding that when we're at the bottom as the victim looking up or the child hoping that someone is going to save them, we are helpless and we don't have a lot of power when we're looking up to who's going to hurt us and who's going to save us. And we put that power outside of ourselves as children are trained to do, as patients are trained to do. As we have been socially conditioned to do, what I'm suggesting, and Tim too, is that we actually become the guardians of the faith of our own selves. That we actually learn how to do those inner processes that help us build inner security so that we can withstand the storms that we're in now and can do that healing work forward and backward too. Is there anything that you would like to add to that piece before we do a visualization to actually go through the inner kingdom to integrate some of the aspects that may have been left behind in the past? You did a great job of explaining that. Um, it, it really does explain part of it. And one of the things that we must also understand is the benefits of either being a victim or the benefits of the other. There's this weird tension that prevents us from going forward. And this is our historical past generationally to maintain the homeostasis, the status quo that may not be very good at all but it also changes and so it keeps it from hurting potentially hurting the future generations so what we're doing now is going no the the change the evolution of our minds our bodies our soul the whole component of us evolving we have to understand the benefits and go okay that may have worked in the 1600s, but it doesn't work now. And we have to be willing to, as we take a step forward, we will be bringing all of that stuff out into the light. And we have to have the, again, permission and courage to actually address that which is ours. And then that which isn't even ours. It's like, where did that come from? And Part of the, the work that I've done is also doing the lineage, going back in the family tree and discovering the losses and the gains and where everything all of a sudden fell apart. Because then I go, hold on, I, I'm trying to make up for the sins of my father. 
and the sins of my grandfather and my great grand? No, you know, and this world has been, especially in the Middle East, has been dictated by the sins of our great, 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 great grandfather who fought against, you know, that person's great, 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 great grandfather. So therefore it's come, hatred has come down the lineage. And now it's either like, we're going, no, we're, and it's not in a, in an airy fairy woo woo kind of way. It's in a practical application of how our brains have protected us up until now. It's, you know, I mean, my background, like I said, was woo-woo, you know, doing all of the energy work and the healing work and everything else. But then I understood that there's actually an, an understanding of how our brains have held us. And the reasons why have been just because our brains haven't evolved the same degree that our techno technology has over the past 20 years, even. So you did a, a great job and I'm looking forward to your process of reintegrating all of that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And if we don't actually talk about why this is so important, then it's very easy to let something else be made more important. It's very easy to throw a technique onto a wound and to bury it further with good information then and make it a really pretty band-aid that actually just keeps the wound festering. Because talking about something that hurts you only perpetuates the hurt. Because where our energy goes, our attention goes, and where our attention goes, our energy flows. So if we're constantly focusing on that which we don't want, we're getting more of it, which is why we're doing this summit right now. If we're not mature and responsible keepers of the faith, guardians of the faith of our own selves, how are we possibly going to come together to actually do what is required now, which is remember why we came? to remember that our souls chose to be here for this leading edge of creation, where humanity literally is now seeding the new human, which is a homoluminous human being, which means that we are those multidimensional beings that are so much more than just the carbon that base that makes us what we thought we were, when now we have 12 strands of DNA coming online and the new ones, the little guys and girls that came through you are literally already wired exactly the way that now we're transitioning into and resisting and not liking because if we're always used to going like this, we don't want to have to go like this to get there. But a child doesn't mind doing that because they have more energy to burn. So we tell them to go further and to do it a different way because they have more energy to burn. Well, what if we actually started owning the energy we have and then recollecting the soul fragments, which give us back energy that we had before we gave it away. And we stopped giving our power to belief systems and ideas that we didn't question to simply accept as if a parental figure were giving us advice that was meant for our interest instead of theirs. When you who have been a parent, is that device or the distraction mechanism for the child or is it for the parent? Well, if we actually take that to a larger governmental level, right now we have to understand that the potentiality is that we're living in an abusive parental culture, which is the cult you are. And that if we think that that daddy is going to come and get us now, that savior is going to come down to get us. What we're discounting is the fact we are the one we've been waiting for. But if we're waiting and giving our power away, then we're not owning what is already here. So that's what we are really offering 
for you to be able to do as you reintegrate the aspects of yourself that previously you allowed to give power to other people, places, things, situations, memories, events. And now instead you can go back through to reclaim for yourself. So I'm going to encourage you to get yourself situated and comfortable and we're just going to do a short guided visualization a journey into that beautiful kingdom so take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth three times feeling yourself fall back in the present moment, fully, grounded, rooted, and you feel the excitement of your youthful self coming to the surface. You feel that part of yourself that longs to come home to yourself. And in that magnificent kingdom, that represents all of the magnificent aspects of your glowing personality. I would encourage you to go to the room that calls to your heart the most. The part of you that may have felt missing when you have tried to do things that that part of you would have given you strength to complete but you had locked away a long time ago and now you choose to knock on that door, to take the master key collection that you carry as the steward of your own personality and take the proper key. Imagine how many there are there, but you know exactly the right one because you know yourself better than anyone else ever could and ever will and you take the key that is right for that door and you open it and as you open that door leave your judgment right where you stand before you step foot over that liminal threshold into the aspect of the personality part that previously you were ashamed of that you judged that you deemed not good enough because of bad advice or because of how someone else's insecurity made you feel when you came up against it. And as you look around and survey this room that has the windows blocked out and with light you do see streaming in, you see the dust collecting all around and it's a space you wouldn't want to spend any time in and so as you then find the part of yourself whatever age they are send that little one love before you send them pity because all they ever wanted was to be loved and all they've ever been willing to do was love you and as you then make eye contact with that aspect of yourself, walk over slowly to where they are sitting. Maybe it's beside the bed, hiding as they thought they needed to do because you are their favorite person and they never wanted to upset you. They just ever wanted to be good enough and for a while thought that meant hiding. But now you go over and you sit with them and you let them know in a very calm and compassionate voice that you want to understand them, that you want to hear them. And truly, when you say it, feel in your heart how much you mean it because they will too. And as you sit, with this aspect of yourself, maintaining eye contact as much as they'll allow it because they still have a ways to go in trusting you again. But as you sit and hold space with them, slowly, 
they'll come around. And you give them the time they need because they have given so much time to being in this part of you to keep it safe while you tried to pretend it didn't even exist. Just take that time to breathe together, to reharmonize yourselves together using the language of your soul, the language both of you spoke and still speak, which is your breath. So use your breath to call that part of you into the moment with you as you are now able to support an aspect of yourself before you judged and now can appreciate because you understand how much it can serve one who understands how to wield the power that that part of you was expressing the moment someone else got uncomfortable with the power that is in you and always has been and that now you don't need to be afraid of. And as you both together with this little aspect of you start getting excited because you realize you don't have to be afraid of your own power anymore. Now you start breathing together more excitedly. And as you do, the thought of leaving this room becomes a more comfortable idea because this room, while it has been a devastating and painful place for this part of you to stay for all that time, it still felt safe because no one would come for it there. So it felt safe even in the dysfunction, even though it felt unloved and unlovable kind of felt safe and we have to appreciate that there will always be a part of us that has a desire to feel safe which is why we want all of what we want and so honoring that and promising committing to become that safe haven for all of you breathing that into the moment between you. So now this aspect of yourself that before didn't feel worthy, didn't feel loved, and didn't feel included, now understands it is part of an ecosystem that is there for all of those who are in it. And as you feel safe together now, you can emerge from that room and move down the corridor together to a safe space where in future, when you go to do something out of your comfort zone, that you need that part of you, it can stay in your heart while you look after what before it might have made an eruption about because it didn't fully understand how to handle what was coming but you do and even if you don't now there are two of you there for that moment when it comes and even if that child just wants to go and play while you look after the next moment that it's afraid of it's part of you again and you can go back and find as many aspects of yourself as possible. And every time you do go through that process of breathing together and building the trust and then unifying yourself with that part of yourself so that eventually you can call all of those fragments back into this present moment where all of our power lies. So if you're not already back in the room, open your eyes and reflect on 
how that felt. You just unveiled the secrets of the warrior. <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, you did. That's um, how it's done. Yeah. You have all those powers within you at any given moment to call upon when needed to not be afraid. How you worded it was uh, perfect. Coming together with, <clears throat> excuse me, whoa, <clears throat> my resistance to wanting to speak, right? Coming together with the power mm -hmm. and letting it be because we're finding each other at this time. And um, the younger ones that are being born, you better be ready. You better be ready to lead them. Right. That was uh, kind of mentioned by Tim. He kind of got a little, touched a little bit on that. But what you were describing earlier, I love fantasy, but um, it's real. It's real. The time is here. I want to read my poem, if you don't mind, because I'm so excited. Because um, after having been through all of this, and then just taking time myself, and then a vow of silence, and not being verbal, universe even threw a major head injury in there, and a couple of deaths, my father, my oldest son. Oh, man, my walk is a little bit different, but the same. The same but different. When I was young, I didn't run, retreat, or anything. I would say, I don't want to be like them. Something was wrong with them. I always felt pure. And I was here to share love. That's why I came to this planet. And they were hurting me. Something was wrong with them. I didn't want to be like that. I had to get away from them. So I emancipated myself at age 15. I held on to what I had. And then when I was 17, I wrote this prism erased because it's what happens to us as a child. Um, so go ahead, crawl out of it. So see if they all care, but not so much as we are told due time. We all must dare things in life that satisfy that here you must not touch. Reality becomes a myth, all seemingly too much. Float away, beyond the cloud, the dark one you are under. Escape away with crystalled mind, bereft, defined to wander. All that is now within our vein, time is just eclipsed. Red, blazed, misty eyes not wide, turn to grace that color of light of which we'd been denied. Oh, shame amid a burst of dew, <laughs> the face you cannot find. Reach out to touch the mirror of black, you owner of what's behind. That was written so many years ago. And here you are, Laura and Tim, and I don't know who else is here. And you have just, hold on, I got it. Uh, that prison erased is now just taken up to a moment of integration amazing thank you for that's the ending of the poem the hurt child okay they tell us what to do they mold us hurt people hurt people okay we know it's not right we float away we don't know we don't know and then comes the right time where we discover, and that's power. Yeah, Laura, I just met you, what, three weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, that's power. I love hearing you speak. You're the voice I um, need to hear right now. Thank you for- I just poured my heart out. <laughs> I, am, I just poured my heart out. I didn't think of it, I didn't prepare, I'm not afraid. Never. And, then, yeah. and it took so many years for you to be able to actually share what flowed from you for so, so easily, so quickly in that poem so many years ago. And yet, 
yeah, because people were afraid, and you said it yourself. They uh, the bigger you, sh the more the brighter you shine. They don't want to be in your shadow, and then they try to turn put your light out. But that's what people um, do. Not everybody, but most. And I find, oh, this just goes into a whole encyclopedia of things probably any of us could describe right now. We're just going to leave that one alone. Um, there are reasons for being like that. Because that's a whole society and now it's a global thing. 